willkommen zu Ask Ingolf, der Saatkorn-Podcast-Serie zum Thema Künstliche Intelligenz mit Ingolf Tietz und Gero Hesse. Ja, einen wunderschönen guten Tag, hallo und herzlich willkommen zu einer neuen Ask Ingolf-Folge. Also erstens muss ich sagen, wir haben euch letztes Mal versprochen, dass wir uns über AI, Movies, Bücher etc. unterhalten. Da haben wir gelogen, das machen wir nämlich heute gar nicht. Und das Zweite, was ich sagen will, ist, ihr kennt das ja alle, äh, mindestens alle, die den Film Hangover gesehen haben, What Happens in Vegas Stays in Vegas, nicht so in unserem Podcast, denn Ingolf und ich sitzen hier im Flughafen Las Vegas, kann sein, dass wir uns etwas müde anhören, wir haben eine Woche HR Tech Konferenz <lacht> hinter uns. Ja. Das, äh, ich glaube, den Eindruck werden alle von der Stimme so ein bisschen haben. Liegt auch darin, dass wir hier äh, sitzen im Umfeld und deswegen nicht ganz so laut sprechen, wie wir es vielleicht genau. sonst machen würden. Ja, ihr hört wahrscheinlich die Hintergrundgeräusche, aber wir müssen heute aufnehmen, weil wir sonst, glaube ich, alles gar nicht mehr so hintereinander bekommen, weil wir die ja. nächsten Wochen so viel zu tun haben. Im Hauptjob. Aber erstmal danke, Ingolf, dass du mich nach Las Vegas geschleppt hast und gesagt hast, da musst du echt mal hin. Ähm, nicht nach Las Vegas an sich, das sicherlich auch, aber ähm, auf die Konferenz. Du warst ja schon mehrfach Ja. und vielleicht kannst du einfach mal erzählen, auch wie die Konferenz sich vielleicht verändert hat. Also ich bin, glaube ich, das zehnte Mal oder sowas äh, tatsächlich da. Die war eine Zeit lang immer abwechselnd in Las Vegas und Chicago. Ähm, mittlerweile ist sie fast nur noch in Las Vegas oder ist sie, glaube ich, nur noch in Las Vegas, tendiert ähm, oder ist so ein bisschen ge flexibel gewesen, sag ich mal, in der Größe. Die Ausstellerfläche war dieses Jahr sehr groß, die war größer als äh, die Jahre davor. Ähm, ich war mir nicht so ganz sicher bei den Teilnehmern, aber das haben sie nicht so, auch nicht so veröffentlicht, wie viel eigentlich da waren. Ja, man konnte nicht so herausfinden, wer eigentlich Aussteller war und ja. wer Teilnehmer war. Also es waren irre viele Menschen, ja, das auf jeden Fall. Ähm, nicht so viele wie in der gleichzeitig, haben wir festgestellt, stattfindenden Mining-Konferenz mit über 44.000 Teilnehmern. Könnte man checken, da gibt es bestimmt auch einen Podcast dazu ja. irgendwo. Aber ist, glaube ich, nicht so ganz unser Metier. Genau. Nee. Aber also zurück zur Konferenz. Ist halt schon sehr klassisch, also wenn wer Geros Festival oder das Embrace Festival kriegt, das, kennt, das ist eine ganz andere Nummer, äh, was man da so geboten kriegt, finde ich. Also das hier ist sehr, sehr konservativ, äh, klassisch. Da war ich übrigens völlig überrascht von, weil ich ja. äh, dachte, dass in den USA der Entertaining-Faktor dann doch etwas größer wäre. Nee, das ist ganz strikt auf Lead-Generierung. Also auch jede Tür, wo man reingeht, in jeden Konferenzraum wird man erst wird das Badge gescannt und ähm, ich habe jetzt auch schon dadurch zahlreiche E-Mails bekommen von Leuten, die mich mit dem Sales-Repräsentanten ja, dann in Verbindung bringen. Genau so. genau. <lacht> ja, aber man muss sagen, also ich, ich fand es klasse, das zu sehen. Es gab ein paar sehr interessante Vorträge. Also mein Höhepunkt war eigentlich der Vortrag von Josh Börsin, der so einen, so einen Gesamtrundumschlag eigentlich gemacht hat über die HR-Tech-Szene. Der, der war auch wirklich echt gut, also ja. muss ich auch sagen. Also die, die, die Vorträge ähm, sind zumindest was die Keynotes angeht, eigentlich immer ganz gut, ähm, auch in den vergangenen Jahren gewesen. Ähm, der Inhalt der Konferenz, ich meine, das sind, glaube ich, weit über 100 äh, verschiedene Präsentationen, ähm, das variiert natürlich dann immer mal von, sage ich mal, tiefe Anspruch, Sales Pitch und so weiter und so fort, aber ähm, was man vielleicht noch sagen kann, dieses Jahr hat ein Thema wirklich alles überstrahlt und das war KI. Also es, war, es gab eigentlich nichts anderes, sonst die Jahre hat man sich noch über Datenschutz unterhalten, ähm, über internationales Recruiting oder sowas, aber wenn dies Jahr in einem Titel kein KI drin vorkam, ich glaube, dann sind die Leute nicht hingegangen. Oder aber es war immer. völlig krass, ich meine, das haben wir in Deutschland auch schon erlebt auf den Messen der letzten Jahre, aber so wie auf dieser Messe habe ich das noch gar nicht erlebt und das Interessante war, ähm, in den Produktdemos, da stellt man dann manchmal fest, ja, da steht AI drauf, äh, ob es dann wirklich drin ist, ja, andere oder das Frage. Das ist, ist halt einfach eine Anbindung. Ich meine, das, also da sind wir nicht irgendwie weiter zurück, glaube ich, in Deutschland, weil ja. eine Anbindung an, an Gen AI von einem der großen Modelle ähm, und die nutzen alle dieselben Modelle, das muss man halt auch sagen. Also der Outcome ist eigentlich, ne, der unterscheidet sich dadurch, wie gut jemand in der Software und der API prompten kann, aber das, was da rauskommt, ist bei allen gleich de, de facto. Also das ist so ein bisschen die gleich, gleich machen. Es gibt halt vier Modelle, die angeboten werden und eins davon nehmen sie. Was ich allerdings schon fand, ich habe ja direkt am ersten Tag in der allerersten Session ein neues Wort gelernt, Agentic AI. 
Ja. Äh, das zielt darauf ab, dass äh, alles mit so, sogenannten Agenten gemacht wird. Man könnte vielleicht auch Bot dazu sagen. Das kannst du vielleicht ja, äh, also genauer... Ich bin mal gespannt, was sich in Deutschland durchsetzen mhm. wird. Irgendwie. Also ich muss zugeben, ich kannte es vorher auch eher unter dem Namen Bot. Aber das ist also diese... KI-Agenten, das ist das anscheinend oder ist das große nächste Thema hier. Das wird dann auch schon wirklich wesentlich komplizierter als das, was wir bisher haben, weil einfach, sage ich mal, was zu generieren, einen Text zu generieren, einen Brief zu generieren, eine Zusammenfassung oder eine Präsentation zu generieren, alles, alles gut, das geht mit den LMs total klasse inzwischen, aber einen Agenten zu haben, der dann die Software, die unten drunter ist, die HCM-Systeme oder sowas quasi bedient, das ähm, wird nochmal eine ganz andere Herausforderung. Also, dass der versteht, was man von ihm will, ja, bloß dieses Verstehen muss dann ja umgesetzt werden mit, ähm, ich fülle deinen Urlaubsantrag auf und aus und schicke den weiter an, äh, an die Freigabe und solche Dinge, wenn man das dann über den Agenten erledigt haben möchte, das ist, wird schwieriger, glaube ich, aber, aber spannend. Und das war, also fand ich schon so ein bisschen revolutionär, weil dieses äh, Agentic AI Topic sich fast durch die ganze Konferenz gezogen hat und äh, ja, das mag noch eine Zeit lang dauern, bis sich das durchsetzt, aber die Idee an sich, du hast einen Agenten oder mehrere Agenten, die die ganzen Software-Systeme da drunter im Grunde genommen ansteuern ähm, und für den User im Grunde genommen auf einer neuen Oberfläche alles rausholen aus den unterschiedlichen Systemen, was da so ja. ist. Das hat natürlich ganz schöne Konsequenzen für die äh, HR-Strategie, äh, aber insbesondere auch die HR-Tech-Strategie. Und das war auch so was, was der Josh Börsin sehr klar gesagt hat. Ich habe mir so ein paar Sachen aufgeschrieben, die ich spannend fand. You can't run HR without HR-Tech-Strategy. Und er hat ganz klar gesagt, das ist neu, relativ und Wer heute ja. CHAO ist und, und sich nicht mit diesem Thema auseinandersetzt, der, der kriegt einen entscheidenden Teil des Businesses gar nicht mehr mit. Und, und das wird also insofern auch wirklich spannend, weil es gibt, gab ja mal so den Spruch irgendwie, there's an app for everything. Ähm, ich glaube, was hier nicht passieren wird, ist, there's an agent for everything. Weil das lässt sich dann nicht mehr bedienen, also, sondern es braucht irgendwie Modelle, ähm, wo ich mit halt einem Agenten auch verschiedenste Softwarelandschaften und sowas bedienen kann. Genau. Und äh, da brauche ich halt dann wirklich eine, eine Strategie, wie ich damit umgehen will und welche Tasks ich auch überhaupt zum Agenten anvertrauen möchte natürlich. Also es ist natürlich wieder was zu tun mit Security und ähnlichen Dingen, Authentifizierung, was darf jemand, was darf jemand nicht. Ähm, wird, wie gesagt, wird spannend. Und ähm damit dann auch verbunden auch so eine, so eine zentrale Aussage, all HR is now connected. Also wir erleben ja derzeit noch so eine Situation, wo es diverse Subsysteme gibt, die auch teilweise gar nichts miteinander zu tun haben. Ne? Also äh, teilweise läuft der Payroll komplett losgelöst äh, von anderen Elementen im HCM oder im Recruiting. Also dieses Ganze miteinander stärker zu verknüpfen und miteinander zu verbinden, das war eigentlich das ganz große Thema. Und ich finde das interessant, es gibt äh, in Deutschland ja diese ganzen Schnittstellenaggregatoren, ähm, die halt verschiedene Systeme miteinander verbinden. Das war jetzt auf der Konferenz gar nicht so das Thema. Ne? Da gibt es, ja, da waren glaube ich auch drei, vier Anbieter, mhm. ähm, die, die da war. Ja, aber es war halt ähm, nicht also so ein Joint. Thema, wo man sagt, das wird das neue, ganz nee, große nein. Ding. Ne? Also, das, also erstens probieren die das hier schon ziemlich lange. Also diese Firmen existieren, also HRNX gab es mal, dann, dann die heißen jetzt Joint, dann gibt es irgendwas, äh, irgendwas mit Cloud ähm, im, im Namen. Also das, das sind glaube ich Dinge, die, die passieren. Ähm, das ist das ist Technik, die man braucht, aber das ist, das ist jetzt kein so ein Thema, was irgendwie halt in die Strategie wirklich ganz stark einfließt oder sowas. Also ich, der, der, glaube ich, der, das, was wirklich jetzt als nächstes Großes kommt, ist genau dieses Agententhema. Mhm. Was oh. früher Employee Self-Service war, wird dann quasi Agent Self-Service und man äh, gibt dann nur noch den Auftrag an den Agenten, schalt mal eine Stelle, in Anführungsstrichen. Die Idee sozusagen, wie Employee Experience sich verändert, das war halt auch echt ein Thema. Ne? Also wird alles deutlich schneller, deutlich, ich sag mal, kundenorientierter, wenn man den Mitarbeiter als Kunden äh, sieht. Und ähm, auch nochmal eine Aussage hier, AI will totally transform Employee Experience, the agent will obsolete 50 to 70 percent of call, all call center functions within HR. Also das ist schon relativ dramatisch, äh, was das für Auswirkungen haben äh, wird. Spannend wird natürlich äh, zu sehen, 
in welchem zeitlichen Horizont sich das eigentlich entwickeln wird. Und was auch nochmal richtig spannend war, war dann so einen Blick auf die ganze HR-Tech-Landschaft zu bekommen. Also was kann man da sagen? Äh, Talent Acquisition spielt auch in den USA eine riesengroße Rolle Jeden und Fall. ist das strategischste Thema, ist aber auch das Thema, was immer sehr nah an den Menschen weiter dranbleiben wird. Das war übrigens auch einhellige Meinung. Ich habe mich da mit verschiedenen Tech-Vendoren unterhalten, die auch alle sagten, ja gut, also wir können die Prozesse deutlich schneller machen durch AI. Ganz am Ende entscheiden sich Menschen für Menschen. Das ist also in Deutschland ja auch die einhellige Meinung, aber das habe ich hier ja. auf der Konferenz also war, auch, war auch die, die Begründung, hat, hat der Philipp ja in seinem ähm, äh, Beitrag auch gesagt, ähm, waren in einem Vortrag bei der, bei der UPS, ähm, die halt in Peakzeiten 120.000 Mitarbeiter in sechs Wochen rekrutieren. Und die haben halt die, die Zeiten, also der, auf der Webseite steht, du kriegst den Vertrag quasi nach Bewerbung in 20 Minuten. Da sind natürlich dann bestimmte Sachen wie Background-Check und hast du wirklich Führerschein und sowas und eine Fahrprüfung äh, sind da noch nicht erledigt, aber du hast den Vertrag dann vorliegen. Also die haben es so durchautomatisiert, das heißt, wenn du die, und dann kommen wir zu einem anderen großen Thema, wenn du die passenden Fähigkeiten und Skills mitbringst und sagst, du, du, du willst und die Voraussetzungen hast, dann, dann geht es halt sofort los. Wahnsinn. Zum also High-Volume-Recruiting, das, das ist schon echt eine logistische Leistung, ja. Das ist sozusagen der, der eine Weg, wo, diese Techn also wo Technologie natürlich eine ganz große Rolle spielt. Und das andere ist immer da, wo es um Individualisierung geht. Ne? Also, also ja. wo wirklich ein, ein Mensch äh, basierend auf seinen oder ihren konkreten Bedürfnissen bedient werden muss äh, im Employee Lifecycle. Also soweit äh, ganz spannend. Was dann auch sehr interessant war, wenn man sich die die ähm, die Messe selbst angeschaut hat und die Aussteller, also das war eigentlich ähnlich wie auf der Zukunft Personalfass, würde ich sagen. Ähm, natürlich mit mehr Tech-Fokus. Der Teppich hatte mehr Stolperfallen. Ja Wie bitte? Der Teppich hatte mehr Stolperfallen ja. als in Deutschland. In Deutschland <lacht> würde man so einen Teppich so nicht verlegen. Ähm, aber erstaunlich, dass sie das in den USA gemacht haben. Ne? Wir, hätten, wir, hätten stolpern sollen. wir hätten stolpern sollen. Mist, das fällt mir jetzt erst ein. Aber was interessant war, da ist eine regelrechte Explosion an Payroll, HR Tech, ein Riesenthema in den USA und äh, ebenso äh, die äh, Core Human Capital Management ähm, ähm, äh, Plattform, also alles da, wo im Grunde genommen Stammdaten drin sind, ja. also diese, diese Suites, das ist auch ein richtig großes Thema und was spannend war, wir haben auch mit äh, vielen Startups gesprochen, ähm, teilweise arbeiten die an ganz ähnlichen Dingen äh, wie, wie auch die deutschen Startups. Teilweise sind es auch sehr US-spezifische Sachen. Gehen wir jetzt nicht drauf ein. Ich habe gleich ein paar Statements. Ja. Ich habe mich mit ein paar äh, Leuten, mit ein paar Gründern da unterhalten und Gründerinnen vor allen Dingen auch. Und äh, da können wir jetzt mal reinhören. I am standing here with uh, Rajat Paharia. He is founder of Ask Steve. Hey Rajat, hey. what is Ask Steve? Yeah. Tell me a little bit about it. So if you've ever used ChatGPT, it's kind of like having this amazing intern at your disposal, but it's kind of like that intern's across the room because you're doing your work in Gmail or LinkedIn or Salesforce or Workday, and anytime you need help, you need to copy that stuff out of the system you're working in, walk it over to ChatGPT, paste it in, get your help, pull it back out, go back, paste it back in, and All it's right. super inefficient, right? And yes. because of that, people don't use ChatGPT nearly as much as they should be to get them, uh, the help that they need. And so Ask Steve is a Chrome extension that basically puts that intern right next to you so that it can see your computer screen and can reach over and type on your keyboard so that you never have to leave the tools that you're already working in. So wow. you stay in Gmail, you stay in LinkedIn, you stay in Salesforce, and you get all that AI help right in line where you already are. And can you transfer then content from the different sources to ChatGPT via us? Yes, yes, exactly. Oh, that sounds so you can great. highlight some text on a page and say, help me with this. You, if you're in a uh, text field like an email box in Salesforce, you can say, write me an email here. All the kinds of things that you could normally do with ChatGPT, you can now do integrated seamlessly into all your existing web and AI HR apps. Well, wow, sounds really great. and. How long are you doing this? How long does Ask Steve uh, exist? Yeah, the company started in March, and then I had the first release to consumers in late June, and now I'm starting business and enterprise sales this week. All right, so I wish you all the best. Thank you. Have fun and uh, talk to you soon. Yes, thank you very much, <laughs> appreciate it. Yeah, Matt Henderson here. He's the founder and chief visionary officer of Uke. Hey Matt, tell me something about Yook. What do you do? Yeah, so Yook has uh, redefined the way that employers offer benefits. Uh, we created a marketplace of lifestyle benefits that give employers the opportunity to, to go beyond the paycheck. 
right? So in today's world, we're used to getting health insurance, dental, vision, you know, all, all the things that are kind of out there and things we don't use in our everyday lives. We've built an entire marketplace that has multiple subscription services and vendors that as an employer, now you can reward your employees with something they're going to use in their everyday life. All, all right. right. So that's, that's where the idea of you came from. Okay, and uh, your sign here says attract, retain, recognize. That's correct. Tell me something about that recognize. Yeah, so, you know, uh, one of the things that we hear from employers is that uh, they're having low engagement scores, right? And so what better way to recognize your talent than by providing them a tailored solution to what they want to use? You know, I always give this analogy or, or this story of I have this drawer and it's full of seven different Starbucks cards, right? I never drink Starbucks. Every time I get one of those attaboys, they're like, hey, you did a really good job, Matt. I get that card and I'm like, thank you. I don't use I it. I don't use it, right? Yeah. And so now if someone were to give me an opportunity to have a Uke platform, um, they can give me those credits instantly and then I can pick where I want to use it. So for me, I'd probably pick Xbox Live. I like to game in the afternoons and so that would be important to me and that's what I would like. Well, in terms of internationalization, I think it might be complex since all these items are different in different regions, aren't they? They are, they are very different in different regions. Uh, one of the things that's unique about our platform is we have over 200 plus brands. They are international as well. Uh, so a lot of uh, what you're seeing here today are the American brands, but uh, I can easily just show you where in Europe we are. We're in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, we're in Australia. Uh, we're in Central and South America. So we've got brands all over the globe. All right. To talk a little bit more in general about this conference, what are the biggest trends in your opinion? Yeah, so the biggest thing I've noticed uh, here at this conference is everybody's using the buzzword AI. Yeah. Right? And it's really exciting to see, uh, but it's actually uh, more interesting to understand how many people are integrating AI and how many people are just using it as a buzzword. Mm. Um, and so I think there's a lot of people that think they've got AI and are really just using some chat GPT. So uh, that's been a really big takeaway for me today is, or this entire conference is it just, I see it everywhere. Yeah, yeah. That's the same thing in Europe, by the way. Is it? So, yeah. yeah. Thanks for the talk. Yeah, thank and you. I wish you all the best with you. Yeah. So. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Bye. Let's go. Standing here with uh, Camilla Beer, actually from Denmark, located in London, but we're talking here on the HR Tech Conference in Las Vegas. And uh, she said to me, I'm not Harriet, and uh, I can exp uh, she can explain why. Why are you not Harriet, and what, what does Harriet have to do with our talk? Yeah, well, <laughs> our company is called Harriet, so oftentimes I get on calls or stand here at conferences, and they're like, oh, hey, Harriet, so <laughs> nice to meet you. But uh, Harriet is the, the AI tool that we've created. Um, and it's essentially a, a, an avatar. And what Harriet does is essentially first, we pull together the different tools that you might have in an HR stack. And then we sync in with the company's existing data sources, like your policies, your handbook, those kind of uh, things. And then we deliver that information to wherever the team hangs out. So that could be Teams, Slack, but we have a few customers, quite a few customers that are have big uh, proportions of their workforce being frontline. So we also deliver that information to text and WhatsApp. So it is a chat interface, really. But our aim is to ensure that HR can get through to those employees that are hard to reach. And so it gives HR a direct line with them and give them kind of HR support in your pocket, if you will. It sounds great. Uh, and how about your, um, your strategy? I mean, yeah. we're talking in Las Vegas, you're located in London. Yeah. Uh, do you this? Uh, do you do the business international already? Where did you start? Yeah. So we started in London, and it was it was quite interesting because it's happened a bit organic that we've come over from from London. Um, what happened was our early adopters were all in London, so we could kind of meet with them, and we built the product around them. And then we did a little bit of press around our fundraising, and what that resulted in was quite a few like a few interested parties coming from from the U.S in our product. And so me as the kind of go-to market person was, was kind of, I just found that interesting and decided that maybe this is a hunch I want to follow. And then now, you know, a big proportion of our revenue is coming from the US. Oh, well. And that's why we're here. In we're terms here. of scalability, yeah. this market obviously is more interesting than let's say Germany or UK probably. Okay. <laughs> uh, Let's talk uh, in general about the, this conference. Yeah. So what, what is your takeaway from the conference? Anything new that you learned? Yeah, great question. I think um, 
I think there's a couple of things. I mean, the, the, generally speaking, and that's true for the last couple of years and also for us, is that obviously AI is on the topic of pretty much every talk or every conversation I've had. So that's not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, so that's been interesting that it's kind of like the, the buyer, let's say, they're, it's now a vertical that's a bit more defined. Um, they have experience shopping for it. They know the questions more so to ask. And I think that's been a big difference from conferences earlier in the year. And then I also think that just from like a personal level, um, it's been a really good conference to meet other tech you know, partners that are doing interesting work in interesting segments. Yeah. All right. Thanks for the mini interview. I wish you all the best with and for Harriet. And talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Yeah. Standing here with Brian Forrester. He's the founder of Job TV. Swipe right to a play, uh, apply. And, and this already says what, it, what, what, what it's about. But the great thing is, it's the first day of your company, right? Yeah, we launched <laughs> here at HR Tech in Las Vegas. It's crazy. So are you coming from Las Vegas? No, we come from uh, Oregon, which is uh, about an hour and a half flight uh, north. All right. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's the start of your company. Congrats! I wish you already all the best. What's the idea of Job TV? Uh, it's really simple. So uh, job seekers don't like searching for jobs on traditional job boards, uh, mainly because people don't read anymore and they don't like to read. So if you've ever spent a morning digging through job postings on a traditional job board, you know, your eyes get tired quickly, you start yawning. Uh, and the truth is that in the recruitment space, we now have more video content than we've ever had before. So we've got more recruitment video content than we've ever had before, but we don't really have a good place to put it yet where job seekers can intentionally discover it. And so what we've built is Job TV, a mobile app that allows job seekers to discover and browse jobs by watching really short videos. If they see something that they like, all they have to do, like you said earlier, is swipe right to apply. Sounds a little Tinder-ish. Uh, it is a little <laughs> bit like Tinder. Someone said it was also like TikTok for jobs. Yeah. I think those are both good analogies. But if you think about it, um, where, do job where do job seekers spend the rest of their day? They spend it on TikTok. They spend it on Tinder. Oh, that's right. They spend it on Instagram and YouTube, all of these things. And then those are video-centric behaviors, right? So that's what they're doing with the rest of their free time. And then when they have to go search for a job, why should they live in a text-only world? Why should they be trapped there with PDFs and bullet points and paragraphs? That makes sense. How was the reaction to Job TV? Uh, it's the third day already of the yeah, HR Tech conference. Yeah. So, uh, Well, I'm really happy right now because I just came from, uh, from another part of the conference and someone told me, they grabbed me by the, the arm and they said, hey, someone told me that, that Job TV, they said Job TV is the coolest thing I've seen at the conference since I've been here. So that really made my morning. I wish you all the best. What's your feeling in general about the conference? What, what's your feeling? What's the biggest trend, the most important topic? Oh, I mean, AI, of course, is everywhere. Um, we, we have some AI components to what we do, but we don't lead with it because we know everybody else is leading with it. So we wanted to kind of focus on what is the value that we're bringing to job seekers? How are we helping employers differentiate and reach people in a different, more compelling way? But I think HR tech in general, uh, it, it's a great way to also build partnerships and just kind of get yourself known, uh, especially as a new company. People are always intrigued by the new things. All right. I wish you all the best. It was Thank great talking much. to you. And yeah, hope to see you soon. And yeah, uh, jobtv.com if anybody wants to learn more. I will add it in the show notes. Thank you so all much. Right? All Thank right. you, Brian. Bye -bye. Standing here with Jake Hart. He's co-founder of Threat Zero Solutions. Very interesting topic, workplace violence. Jake, what is Threat Zero Solutions about? Well, what we do is we implement the federally recommended, for lack of a better term, best practices on how to proactively prevent violence in the workplace. There's 30 years of data from the FBI, Secret Service, Department of Defense, and Department of Homeland Security that spells out how companies can take a proactive stance against things like uh, targeted mass violence. Um, and in the process of addressing those concerns, we're actually able to pick up you know, a lot of interesting signals about people who may be suicidal or um, prone to self-harm, experiencing domestic violence or other sorts of abuse uh, outside of work, with the goal really being, let's surface these signals up to management, let's assess it and understand it so that we can help 
get that person off of a negative pathway and onto a more productive and hopeful pathway that's going to be better for their future. Uh, it sounds a little bit like improving the company's culture in a way. Yeah. So Definitely. One of the topics we talk about is creating a culture of shared responsibility. That's a term that we borrow from the FBI. But, you know, the whole idea is that you know, looking out for one another and sharing these concerns that you observe is an act of care and compassion. And you can help get services and help for your coworkers that may be in need of those things and make the, the whole company better as a whole. It sounds a little bit in the field also of self-responsibility. So to take responsibility yeah. for oneself, but also for your colleagues. Yeah. And it's interesting that you bring that up. We've partnered with Dr. Paul Stoltz. Uh, he's a New York Times bestselling author. He's also the U.S. Olympic team's coaches coach for uh, mental health and wellness and resilience. And so one of the ways that we approach this problem also is by helping people become an upstander rather than a bystander. Oh, I like um, and, you know, that means really looking at any difficulty in your life, whether that be at work or, or personally, and, and how do you take that adversity and harness it to your advantage as opposed to letting it crush you. And if we can help more people do that, then you know, it will create a, a safer environment for all of us because the people who are prone to violence or some of these other issues that I mentioned, ultimately they have difficulties in their life that they have not been able to cope with in a productive way. That sounds really great. How's the reaction to Threat Zero Solutions here on this fair? Uh, it's been pretty good. Um, you know, we work with a lot of schools as well. You know, if you look on the news in the United States, there's a lot of, uh, you know, unfortunately, there's, there's active shooter events um, that are fairly common, um, especially at the beginning of the school year, especially, um, you know, after prolonged breaks from school. So, you know, anybody who maybe isn't, a fit for this because they're a remote worker or whatever. Most folks are saying, oh, well, what about schools? How do I get this in my, my kid's school? How do I get this in, you know, whatever? So people are, are you know, the, the, the topic itself is, is, is uh, provocative for people. Uh, I guess so. What's your uh, takeaway from the conference in general? Did you learn something new? Are you surprised about something? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think... Um, You know, one of my takeaways um, has been that, you know, I think people are more overworked and probably more under-resourced than ever before. And so we've always had the goal of making this as easy to implement as possible. I'm a business businessman first. I'm not a subject matter expert necessarily on this topic. Uh, my co-founder is a subject matter expert. He's in the FBI for 27 years. So, you know, it's my job, you know, kind of as, as the business guy to help make sure that this is easily implementable because these businesses have so many other things that they're thinking about and worried about. You know, there's talent acquisition, there's compliance, there's all these other things that they're worried about. So how do we prioritize employee wellness and safety while not getting in the way of the function of the business? Um, you know, and that's something that we've always been committed to, but in some of these conversations I've had, I, I think my, my commitment to that is, is renewed in a sense. No, that, that's, that's a great outcome of the conference. So yeah. thanks for your time, Jake. I wish you all the best for Threat Zero Solutions. Yeah, no, And thank you. Yeah, hope to, to meet you again. Likewise. <laughs> Standing here with Smarter Tatmore from Claro Mentor here in Las Vegas. Actually, she's coming from Israel. Yeah. Long way. <laughs> long way, long <laughs> flight, yes. So tell me something about Claro Mentor. What, you, what do you do here? Excellent. So Claro Mentor is actually an uh, organiza HR consultant and she's very smart and brilliant. She's based on AI. Claro Mentor, the platform is uh, starting with understanding the individual unique drivers, motivations, uh, because drive, motivational drivers are the operating system of the human beings. It affects behavior, communication, and every interaction that we are doing. And also she learns the DNA of the company, the cultural DNA of the company. And based on that information, she provides you with a very accurate, uh, personalized advice on how to better communicate, collaborate, and perform. Uh, uh, so the company will be more effective and productive. That sounds really great. Uh, to me, if I paraphrase, it's like um, 
an AI coach and I, I have to think about um, real life coaching uh, companies such as Coach Hub or something, but it seems like you're doing this AI enabled and scalable. Absolutely. So let's say that in the organization, usually very few leaders, executives get to get mentorship or coaching. Uh, so most of the people in the organization are clueless and helpless. Yes. So our AI consultant is available to anyone, everywhere, anytime in the organizations, available on their workflow tools so they can it pro proactively provides you with advice on how to better communicate or collaborate with your peers or managers or employees. Uh, it costs a lot of money because many of the time we are clashing in conflicts and misunderstanding and miscommunicating. So by understanding deeply what other people needs or driven by or the way they communicate, if you are accurate about how you're approaching them, you get a lot done with less um, waste of time and, and energy. Did you listen to uh, Josh Bursin's keynote yesterday morning? Yeah, I did. So probably you found it nice that he said this AI-enabled coaching will be a very big thing. I agree. So. I definitely agree. And I've seen that coming as the moment uh, AI, generative AI came to the world. We are dreaming this years ago. And then when the generative AI came out, we, were under we understood that we have this platform to scale in a very, very quick way. And our Gen AI, our LLM is trained and augmented with a lot of deep understanding and, and a, a lot of know-how and practice, best practices that we have developed throughout the years. I'm coming from organizational consultancy. See, I, am a, a, I was an executive coach myself and VP of HR. Uh, so now I could put all of my if knowledge, energy, energy passion. experience, passion, <laughs> of course, and motivations. All my motivations are here. And uh, we think that we are uh, democratizing this coaching ability to anyone in the organization, making it very approachable. And more than that, it's very uh, specific and, and tailored to any one of the individuals. We believe that people... The variety of people is a huge asset to an, to an organization, but it also makes it very complex. Absolutely, absolutely. And people are complex, right? <laughs> so we want to simplify this complexity and uh, utilize the beauty of the individuals by providing them with individ personalized advices on how to better communicate and be more proactive, productive, and effective at, wor at work. Sounds great. How is the reaction here on this conference? To Claro Mentor? Actually, we got great reactions That's and a lot good. of, yeah, this is very exciting because it, it, gives it gives us a lot of assurance that what we are doing is the right thing and it has a huge need. And we are actually providing a good solution to a, a big pain. Um, and we are addressing um, a need in the in the market. So I think for a young startup at our phase, that's amazing to know and get uh, get uh, you know those feedbacks. And I'm looking forward to more clients to come. Yeah, I wish you all the best. What's your takeaway from the conference in general? Were there topics that surprised you? Nothing, you yeah. know, because um, the AI is huge. Yes. You know, you, you, uh, there is AI anywhere <laughs> all the time. Uh, so true. AI, of course, is huge. Uh, I was surprised that uh, com uh, compensation platforms are the growing ones. That was a surprise for me. Uh, but so it's like a big comeback of payroll. Yeah, <laughs> I know. That's crazy. Yeah. I wasn't expecting that. Uh, but I do believe that still uh, engagement and retention are still a huge uh, issues that are bothering our clients. And then uh, employee engagement is still strong. Um, you know, that's at the end of the day, people are people. And, and will be people. And we will be with the AI we still be human beings. So yeah, perhaps even more so. I sounds I do sounds a little bit strange. Uh, but no, not at all. I think mm. for, from my perspective, even using the AI to help you understand better the others and be able to communicate in a more, more appropriate way, it makes you more human because people want to be seen and want to be heard. And by using AI, you are able to 
reach that in an easier way. So I believe that what we are doing is making this world of work being more human-centric and more humanized, it's enabling uh, people in the organization to collaborate better, to communicate better, uh, to see each other. And, and that's all we need. It's a very nice thing. I wish you all the best, Smada, with Claro Mentor, and perhaps you, you meet again. <laughs> let's, let's do that. I'm looking forward. Thank bye you bye. very much for your time. Okay, now we talk about the mixture of influencer marketing with recruitment marketing. I'm standing here with the CEO and founder of Flockity. Her name is Tracy Parsons. Hi, Tracy. Hi, how are you today? I'm fine. Great. Tell me something about Flockity. Well, Flockity is actually designed to mash together two things that people are already doing, right? People are already paying for clicks for their jobs, right? People are putting jobs on Google and Facebook and LinkedIn and paying for clicks. And people are already sharing jobs online. Flockity just mashes those two things together to create an influencer marketing platform for recruiting. It's influencer marketing for jobs. All right. When did you found Flockity? Um, about September of last year. All right. So yeah. pretty new. Oh, we are very new. Yeah, we were in stealth beta from September to January. And we discovered that we had a pretty significant product market fit. So we took it public in February and okay. we've been going and growing since. And how's the conference going for you? Did you have interesting talks here? Amazing conversations yeah? with right. amazing future partners. Like oh, perfect. There are a lot of partners who are interested in, hey, how do we start distributing our jobs to your influencers to drive traffic to our customers' jobs? So we just signed our first programmatic partner on Monday of this week. And Congrats. Thank you so much. And the, uh, the other programmatic platforms are like, wait, we want to play. <laughs> It's like, okay. All right. That sounds great. In terms of um, the business model itself, as far as I understood, you are using all the people in the company to distribute the job ads. Is that the right thing? No, it's no. not. So please But explain. It's close. Absolutely. Um, so we find influencers specific to the industries all right. and specific to the skill set yes. that our customers want to hire for. Okay. So if we have people, we have customers that need to hire data scientists or technologists. So or you have a data sales. scientist influencer talking about this field. We have a family this of all data right. okay. sciences. Right? So we have all of these influencers in there and all they're doing is creating content about doing their job, like how to be a great nurse and what it means to be a great data scientist or a software developer or a salesperson or a marketer. And they're already creating all of this content. And then every couple of days, they'll put a post up that says, hey, I've come across some new jobs in marketing or sales or whatever. Go check my, go check my link in bio and, and see if anything clicks with you. And if it does, we are a pay per performance model. So it's pay per click. And if anybody clicks on that influencer's link, they get paid, I get paid, and the company gets traffic. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, Where's the link uh, from the prof from the job ad to the influencer to the company? So the influencer talks about their job, yep. um, and then they say, "Ah, oh, here's an interesting opportunity." Yes. By the way, okay. That's exactly right. That's how and it And these works. aren't people who work for the organization. Yes. Um, we do have some. We do have some interested customers who want to come on and use it as a referral engine, right? So instead of paying an employee a referral bonus when somebody is hired, why can't we distribute jobs through our employees? It's kind of a new way of thinking about it. But yeah, what what really has been exciting is watching watching our influencers tell us what jobs are going to work best for us in the last year. Like, so the, the last year for us, I mean, again, to your point, we've only been around for a year and it's been our goal to study what industries, job families, like what works and what doesn't so that we can have a really nice story to go to market. So all of our customers know this is, this has never really been done before. It may or may not work, but let's give it a shot together. Let's innovate together. And they've all been on board. It's really, it's really fun to watch. Yeah, I wish you all the best. Thank you. Talking uh, in a more general way about this conference, is there any takeaways that surprised you? Or do you say, well, it's AI all the time? Th there is a flood of AI. Yeah. I'm actually pretty shocked by the number of payroll providers in the world. Like, I get it. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, the payroll and compliance, and it's something that I, I've never dabbled in. Like my career has always been about recruitment marketing, but yeah, we have to pay people, so that's cool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Thank a you lot so of AI, A lot of AI, <laughs> Lord have mercy. And then somebody asked me, they're like, oh, what's the AI behind Flockity? <laughs> and I sarcastically said, actually individuals. <laughs> that's 
really refreshing. I mean, I'm, I'm also totally into AI, but who isn't at the end of the day? Right. I mean, there's AI in our platform. Yeah, yeah. But, but you don't promote it actively, and no. that uh, sets you apart from a lot of other providers. It's a lot less yeah. noise. Yeah, all yeah. right. <laughs> people believe people. That's, our, that's kind of our tagline. Like, you want your jobs to be promoted by actual people that people trust. Yeah. People don't trust. That makes sense. Thank you so much, Thank Tracy. So much. I wish you all the best with Flockety. Thank you so much. And yeah, talk to you in the future. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. So, immer noch auf der HR Tech Konferenz, aber jetzt mal in Deutsch. Ich habe nämlich am ersten Tag getroffen einen guten alten Bekannten, Philipp Segers von Case. Kennen jetzt Select, werden die meisten von euch kennen. Philipp, was machst du hier in Las Vegas? Ähm, ja, das ist eine gute Frage. Nein, äh, wir... Wir haben tatsächlich immer mehr US-Kunden und deswegen ist es, glaube ich, so langsam an der Zeit, dass wir auch ein bisschen mehr im US-Markt machen. Das war tatsächlich schon die vierte US-Konferenz, die ich dieses Jahr mitgemacht habe und äh, gefällt mir ganz gut hier. Ja. Umso schöner natürlich, wenn man dann doch noch ein paar alte Bekannte aus Deutschland trifft. Ja, war sehr lustig. Wir sind direkt am ersten Tag über den Weg gelaufen und haben seitdem auch relativ viel Zeit miteinander verbracht. Für die wenigen, die äh, Ken Head Select nicht kennen, erklär doch mal Elevator-Pitch-mäßig, was ihr eigentlich macht. Wir sind, äh, wir sind gestartet als Forschungsprojekt, ähm, weil wir uns darüber geärgert haben, dass man mit Noten und mit Abschlüssen so wenig äh, vorhersagen kann, was den, was den späteren Berufserfolg ähm, eben anbelangt und äh, genau, sammeln extrem viele Daten im Bildungsbereich zur Notengebung, zur Leistung von Studierenden und ermöglichen damit einen weltweiten Vergleich von Bildungsabschlüssen. Machen das für Unternehmen in der, in der Vorselektion, machen das aber auch für Talente, die ihre eigenen Abschlüsse äh, bei uns eingeben können und dann sich selber so ein bisschen benchmarken. Genau. Wir kennen uns schon relativ lange. Ich glaube, das erste Mal habe ich mit euch gesprochen, als ihr gerade gegründet hattet. Äh, ja, da waren wir noch wirklich Forschungsprojekt und hatten null Mitarbeiter. Wann, wann, wann habt ihr gestartet nochmal? Das Forschungsprojekt ist 2015 gestartet. Ja, ich glaube genau. 2017 seit, haben wir gesprochen. Genau, und seit ja. 2020 haben wir Mitarbeiter und wachsen. Ja, cool. Genau. Ihr seid ja in, in Köln und ich denke, oder du hast es mir schon erzählt, ihr wachst vor allen Dingen mit internationalen Kunden, die aus Deutschland kommen, aber weltweit tätig sind. Ja, genau. Also der deutsche Markt ist, ist spannend dieses Jahr, ist schwierig. Wir kommen, da, wir kommen da gut voran. Ich will mich gar nicht beklagen. Da gibt es, glaube ich, andere Unternehmen, die mehr leiden. Aber das Wachstum im Moment kommt tatsächlich vor allem aus äh, internationalen Kunden und da sind die USA natürlich wichtig, aber wir haben jetzt auch gerade ähm, die, die Universität in Auckland äh, ist jetzt Kunde geworden bei uns und hat eine riesen Studie mit uns gemacht und das ist total spannend, weil dieses Problem eben Bildung zu vergleichen äh, an sehr, sehr vielen Orten auftritt und in Auckland ist eben so, dass die überrannt werden mit Bewerbungen aus, aus Asien, also ja. aus Indien, aus China ähm, und diese, diese, diese kleine Neuseeländ schöne neuseeländische Stadt da ähm, ja, wahnsinnig, wahnsinnig viel zugeschickt kriegt, ja. Mega. Ähm, lass uns mal einmal kurz über die Konferenz an sich sprechen. Ähm, HR Tech Konferenz hier in Las Vegas. Was sind so deine Takeaways? Gibt es irgendwas, was dich überrascht hat? Ähm, tatsächlich hat mich jetzt nichts komplett äh, aus den Schuhen äh, äh, geschossen. Ähm, ich glaube, wir haben da in Deutschland ähnliche Themen, äh, mit denen wir uns umgeben, ist natürlich hier ein bisschen unverkrampfter, was so naja, AI und solche, solche Themen anbelangt. Es gibt keinen Datenschutz, es gibt da wenig, wenig Regulierung zu. Mitbestimmung gibt es auch nicht. Genau, ich weiß manchmal nicht, ob das gut oder schlecht ist. Ich habe hier auch viele Sachen gehört, da bin ich ganz froh, dass die irgendwie in Deutschland nicht, nicht so erzählt werden, also dann von irgendwelchen Unternehmen, die da komplett automatisiert, der Bewerbende redet im, im Video nur noch mit einem Computer und kriegt dann einen Vertrag oder nicht. Weiß ich nicht, ich, bin, ich meine, wir machen ja selber Algorithmen. Ich bin der Meinung, dass es das eine gigantische Technologie ist, um uns in unserer Entscheidung zu unterstützen. Ob wir jetzt die Entscheidung selbst auch noch abgeben müssen, da, ähm, da wäre ich ein bisschen kritischer. Aber klar, die, die, die großen Themen sind auch hier, ganz viel Gen-AI-Themen. Gen ähm, durch das Gen-AI-Thema natürlich auch ganz viel so Sachen wie jetzt Skill-Mapping, Skill-Matching, weil das eben leicht geworden ist. Ne? Also jeder, der irgendwie einen rudimentären Skill-Matcher haben will, der kann ja mal vier Prompts schreiben und dann da irgendwie ein paar Sachen hochladen und dann, dann wird das schon irgendwie gehen. Ne? Ja. Gab es ein Highlight, ein inhaltliches, was du hier gehört, gesehen hast? Ähm, fällt mir tatsächlich schwer, das jetzt zu sagen. Also ich habe ähm, hab mir viele Vorträge angehört. Jetzt gerade der letzte, wo ich rauskam, das war schon total spannend, weil... Ähm, na, wir kennen das ja auch in der deutschen Perspektive, da reden wir oft irgendwie über die, über die Deutsche Bahn, die so enormes High-Volume-Recruiting äh, leistet und da irgendwie äh, Kleinstädte einstellt. Jetzt war ich gerade bei UPS. Die ähm, stellen Großstädte ein. Die stellen, ja, das sind irgendwie 100, 125.000 Leute in sechs Wochen, die die da immer einstellen fürs, fürs Peak-Geschäft. Und das ist schon spannend, weil das einem irgendwie zeigt, sowas geht halt eigentlich nur mit Automatisierung. 
und die gleichzeitig aber auch eben erklärt haben, die Automatisierung, und das ist ein Argument, was wir, glaube ich, schon alle ganz oft gehört haben, aber die haben das eben sehr stark mit Leben gefüllt, ähm, die ermöglicht uns das überhaupt, den Prozess menschlich zu halten. Also wenn man 125.000 Leute in sechs Wochen einstellt und da nicht alles, was man automatisieren kann, automatisiert, dann gehen die Menschen unter in, in Paperwork. Dann geht es nur um Formulare. Und die haben eben einen sehr starken Case dafür gemacht, dass sie dadurch, dass sie am Anfang viel Automatisierung im Prozess haben, am Ende viel mehr Zeit haben und dadurch eben auch so Sachen wie, wie ähm, Turnover reduziert haben. Also die Leute bleiben jetzt länger, nicht wegen der Automatisierung. Wegen der Automatisierung kommen mehr am Anfang durch den Funnel und alles ist irgendwie schneller und besser. Innerhalb von 20 Minuten geben die ein Jobangebot raus mit Vertrag. Also ist schon, schon beeindruckend. Ähm, aber haben dann eben am Ende viel Zeit, um eben darüber zu reden, was man für Boni kriegt, wenn man länger dabei bleibt und wie der Job ist. Und ähm, das, das klappt für die sehr gut. Das fand ich jetzt tatsächlich spannend. Abgesehen natürlich von den großen Keynotes, die wir jetzt irgendwie alle gehört haben. Ja. Und da hast du sicherlich irgendwie auch schon ein bisschen drüber geredet. Alles klar. Danke für deine Einschätzung. Hat mich total gefreut, dass, dass wir uns hier getroffen haben. Ja, mich auch. Wir werden den Tag ja noch zusammen verbringen. Ich wünsche aber jetzt schon mal weiterhin viel Spaß. Danke, Gero. Bis demnächst mal wieder bei Saatkorn oder auf dem Embrace Festival oder wo auch immer wir uns treffen. Bis dann. Ciao. Ja, soweit ein paar Statements aus der internationalen Startup-Szene. Ein anderes Thema, eigentlich das zweite große Thema, was sich durchzog neben Agentic AI, ist äh, Trommelwirbel, das, äh, das Thema Skills. Ne? Ja, also natürlich immer verbunden mit, mit AI mittlerweile, also mit Richtung Matching und Ähnlichem, aber halt ganz stark nochmal weg von ähm, Definition eines Jobs als Job, ne, mit einer festen, festen Description, sondern ähm, immer von den Einzelskills aus betrachtet und äh, auch solche, solche Aussagen, okay, man braucht keine Degrees mehr, stimmt nicht, also das kam auch nochmal ganz stark rüber, der, der Degree oder der Abschluss ist eigentlich ein Sammel, Sammelbucket von verschiedenen Skills, die man dann hat. Also wenn jemand einen bestimmten Degree hat, kann ich in der Regel davon ausgehen, dass er bestimmte Skills dann auch wiederum mitbringt. Aber fast alle gehen davon aus, dass man Arbeit halt in Zukunft viel stärker wirklich nur noch über die Skills beschreibt und nicht über eine, eine klassische ähm, Job Description in dem Sinne mit, das ist jetzt der Job, der war schon immer so, sondern also kein, kein äh, Learn, Work, Die in einem Unternehmen, sondern Learn, work, learn, work, learn, work. Ähm, eigentlich nichts Neues, das wissen wir eigentlich die ganze Zeit schon, aber es wird halt durch die, durch die Einzelsachen oder Einzelskills, äh, die, man, die man jetzt gerade im Fall mit, mit KI lernen muss, glaube ich, alles nochmal viel schneller. Ein weiteres Thema, was sich äh, natürlich durchzog neben Agentic AI und der Skill-Thematik, ist, äh, wen wundert das ganze Thema Daten. Nochmal eine schöne Aussage von Josh Börsen. Äh, Börsen, äh, AI Companies are not software companies, but data companies. Und auch das konnte man ganz klar sehen auf der Konferenz. Ganz klar, weil das Wichtigste, wenn ich irgendwie selber was trainieren will, mal von einem Ab LMM-Modell äh, abgesehen, ähm, dann brauche ich die Daten. Und wenn ich die nicht habe, kann ich die tollste Software haben. Ich, ich kann keine KI trainieren und kann somit stehe ich nackig da. Und äh, da sind natürlich jetzt alle im Vorteil, die, die halt über lange Zeit viele Daten gesammelt haben, die über Kundendaten viele Daten zusammenkriegen. Man muss auch sagen, das wird hier in den USA natürlich irgendwie ein ganz bisschen anders Etwas betrachtet. skrupelloser. Etwas skrupelloser betrachtet, ja. Also wenn ich da dann halt die Daten in einem großen äh, Software-as-a-Service-Anbieter reinschmeiße, dann wird damit halt wird positiv aus, äh, wird das auch umgedeutet mit, wir verbessern damit die Anwendung für alle. Ähm, weiß ich nicht, ob das so die europäische Sichtweise unbedingt immer ist, aber ähm, natürlich geht es nur damit, äh, muss man auch sehen. Also ohne das wird man es nicht hinkriegen. Das ist faszinierend. Ich habe mich äh, ähm, am Ende der Konferenz noch mit einigen größeren Playern unterhalten. Besonders beeindruckt hat mich da Visier. Ähm, da können wir jetzt auch noch mal reinhören ja. und ja, kommen gleich noch zwei, drei weitere Statements. Und jetzt können wir, glaube ich, sagen, an der Stelle machen wir jetzt hier mal einen Punkt. Aber nächstes Mal kommt unsere Kulturfolge. Kultur und AI. Genau, das ist gut. Da muss ich mich bestimmt noch ein bisschen drauf vorbereiten. Ja, noch ein paar Filme gucken, genau. Können wir nachher im Flieger machen. So, äh, jetzt aber erstmal noch mal ein paar Statements von der HR Tech Konferenz in Las Vegas 2024. So, next in uh, this little series is Paul Rubenstein. He's Chief Customer, Customer Officer. Officer yeah. at Vizier. So, yeah. welcome to the Zartcon podcast. Thank you. <laughs> welcome, welcome to Las Vegas, where we're 
all we want is some water and some lip balm as we all dehydrate. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's my first time here. Uh, where do you come from? Um, I'm a New Yorker living in Vancouver, British Columbia right now. Right. So it's uh, so. I'm a long way from home. Also a different climate here. <laughs> yeah, you ain't kidding. And yeah. plus, you know, for anybody who's listening, uh, neither of us have breathed outdoor air for the last like 48 hours. That's it's so not crazy, healthy. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely true. Great. Okay. Um, yesterday I was listening to Josh Bersin's uh, amazing keynote. Yeah, yeah. And he mentioned also Vizier as one of the most yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well known, but also most. Uh, um, exciting companies at this uh, point in time. So please give the listeners some uh, insights what you're doing. Some and background? Yeah. Sure. I mean, like, when I, I mean, Vizier has been actually around for 15 years and we helped create the category that we now know as people analytics. Yes. Like, when I first started in this, nobody had a people analytics manager. Um, it was like a science experiment or et cetera. Because at scale, right, you know, you can get one or two people who might be good at Power BI or something. But the actual having a really robust data model around HR, which is a complicated data model, yeah. right? You know, and being able to string together all the disparate systems that the data hides, right? You know, you got your applicant tracking systems, you got your secret spreadsheets, you got your core HRMS, you got your shares, you got all these different things. And harmonizing that data in a way where you can create interesting, right? Interesting and humanly accessible insights. Not something that it takes a specialty analyst to do, but something that would be interesting to your average HR business leader or to a people manager who has to make decisions about people. That's what Vizier does, right? So we created sets of technology that, and all kinds of innovation that brought down the cost and accessibility and beauty of interacting with data um, and that helped ignite a market, other competitors, etc. And it's just been an amazing journey. I think uh, that what you're doing with Vizier, but also other people analytics companies, really changed the way how HR is perceived. Because in the past, it was always people joined HR because they wanted to work with people. And I think uh, nowadays, uh, the competency set really... Uh, change a lot. I mean, you, you need decisions based on facts and figures, and that's exactly what you're helping well, with. Well, the, the mission, right? So you have to look at analytics as, as something different, like, and, and it's been on a journey, right? But if you think about the mission of HR and what people ask from the head of HR, it used to be compliance, right? Mm -hmm. keep, us out, keep us out of lawsuits, make sure employees you know, are, are compliant with the law, make sure we're compliant with But the law. But that shifted a lot. But now it's like, hey, you have to actually impact business exactly. outcomes, right? Exactly. And that's actually hard to do when you don't have direct influence. And one of the best examples of doing this well is the CFO, right? Yeah. The CFO doesn't write every check and make every decision, but the CFO is good at unpacking business strategy into talent strategy. And then, I'm sorry, into financial strategy. They unpack business strategy and financial strategy, and then they get that they have to align lots of distributed decisions far from the C-suite to a collective outcome, right? So what do they do? They create a rhythm of information. At least once a month, you get a p &L and you hold that up to yourself and it's a mirror. What have I done to get me here? And where will I go next on the path to the collective outcome, right? There's not a personal, there, you can't use bias. You can't exactly. use personal preference. You actually are held accountable for that. What People Analytics has unlocked for the head of HR is the ability to do the same with the shape of talent and the workforce outcomes. They are able to now take that data. And by the way, that data isn't just who left and who came. It's who got trained. What was the manager instability rate? Who's engaged and not, right? And they're able to take that and syndicate that information to everybody and hold them accountable in a, in a proper rhythm. That changes the way we think about the HR function. It starts to look a little bit more like um, FP&A maybe. Yeah. It starts to look, a, and, and it changes the nature of what the HR business partners and the HR leaders are accountable for. They have to show up and say, not what, what's interesting, 
but how are the collective decisions and the program of that managers make and the programs that HR puts together, how are they coming together to drive towards a specific shape of the workforce? And never before has workforce shaping been so important. Mm -hmm. AI is disrupting jobs at the individual level, right? So if you think about the license of a job, the things that are, could be done by AI or could be automated, right? You now are left with seven eighths, right? Now that changes how you think about planning the workforce and team composition. HR has to supply the insights for that and at the same time also apply those to the way HR does business itself. So this is like an amazing moment for HR. Yes. Um, and so we've been really lucky because we are, have helped companies understand all of their people data in a deep domain. We've been able to deliver real practical working AI to help um, customers and, and to help anybody say, I don't need to know the secret language of HR. I can just say, who are my top performers? Um, why are they performing better than other people? Um, who is at risk of exit? Why are they at risk of exit? And this becomes data and fact-based, but accessible to everybody um, securely with respect. Um, and um, it, it just changes the conversation and the way we think about managing people. I'm sorry, that was a really long rambling answer that's, to your that's, question. That's, <laughs> but that's totally okay because you, you stress several points that are always relevant for my podcast. In terms of the HR role, the CHR ro uh, role that, that uh, really shifted a oh, lot yeah. during the last years has a lot to do with what you just explained. Yeah? Uh, especially if you take into terms that personal costs are the main cost driver for the most companies. So it's re directly business related, yeah? directly. Yeah. Well, so. speaking about business related, right? What's interesting about you know, watching our customers over the years is what, look, what good looks like for people analytics and the HR function has shifted, right? At first it was, how do we build a factory? How do we deliver people analytics answers at scale, right? Yeah. Efficiency of the function. Then there's the next set of our customers. They've done that, but they are, the head of HR has woken up and said, people analytics needs to report directly to me. Mm -hmm. I have to set the agenda of the content that is being distributed. I am, want to tackle engagement, turnover, whatever it is, and I want to shape it the way I talked about like using the panel. I want to shape those decisions. But then there's this third group, and these are people who are rethinking what HR's mission is yeah. around business performance. And they're looking outside in, not what data is interesting to HR, but if I were to look outside in from a people manager, from a manager's point of view, right? What's interesting is when I take the data of work and the data of people oh, but, and, and put them together, because work is the currency that we think about as human beings. How many sales did I make? How many tickets mm -hmm. did I close? How many articles did I write? We don't think of our, our, our accomplishments in terms of a performance rating or an engagement score. But when you combine those two together, that's where the magic happens. And these are our customers who are, are finding a competitive edge by unlocking those patterns and seeing what real productivity is. Engagement says what is the impact that work has on people, right? Mm -hmm. But now we can turn around and measure productivity, which is the impact that people have on work. Now, that's complicated data, and it's a noisy world if you're manager. AI creates some magic because now it's easy to understand those patterns It's easier to interact with those patterns and find the signal in the noise, right? And it's more efficient to deliver those patterns. So it's a whole new aperture and a whole new mission for HR to impact business outcomes. And it's really exciting. In terms of what you are doing at Vizier, what are the latest innovations that, that you have in your product? Oh my God, I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> we you don't, so many, you don't, we, don't have to explain all. <laughs> Take one or two well, things. Well, I mean, let's just, I mean, let, let's start with the obvious one then what we won the award here for this year, right? Which is, um, we were, which is what we've done with V, which yeah. is an AI assistant that helps people um, interact with analytics and deliver insights at scale, in new ways, in plain language, securely, respectfully, um, and it's, it's a game changer. And we were very blessed because our company, like early on, 
we normalize the data across all of our customers, and we're, we're, we grow. And, and it isn't just our it isn't just enterprises that mm -hmm. buy from us. We have other companies that use us to as their analytics platform. So the richness of this data, this deep data model, and our understanding of it has allowed us to deliver high quality mm -hmm. uh, AI, and mm -hmm. it's given us just this incredible you know head start on the market. And our customers are using it in practical ways. How do you make the HR business partner's life easy? How do you change the way you think about inquiries into HR? Is it handled by a human or is it handled by this? And now we're opening it up um, to say, okay, I can alert you, right? Imagine this. This, this. this innovation enables a whole new HR service delivery model where I can say, oh, I'm having a good day. I get an alert. Your turnover has reached a certain threshold. Excuse me. Your turnover has reached a certain threshold. Pay attention, which is different than getting a monthly report. Yeah. It's like finding out that you know you get an alert that your bank account is overdrawn. You pay attention. Signal the noise. Hey, I don't want to go talk to HR. I need in that moment of knowing that alert. Help me show the richness of the data. What is driving this resignation rate? What is what are the factors? interacting with the policy manuals and practices within the AI to say, what are my options? How have other people do it? How do I have a good stay conversation? Things like that. This, again, allows the truly human problems to be solved by humans and makes it easier for us to figure. That is a huge innovation, all because it is a technology innovation that helps HR innovate their delivery model and ultimately elevates decision-making and, the, and the better managers, et cetera. I, I would say it innovates HR yeah. itself, the yeah. whole role. If you look into the future, let's assume we would be sitting here in 25, one year uh, further down the line. What would you expect until then? Either what would be the, the big, yeah. big topic uh, I, 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 in, in a year from now? I think there's a couple of things that are con converge. The thing I, that what I would look for is number one, the surface of interaction with HR is going to change. Nobody cares about HR systems, but if they're operating in Copilot or any, you know, any whatever sits next to their email, that's, whatever. That's that's a agentic uh, yeah. um, AI topic, right? Okay, so that's number one. The surface of work yeah. will change. Number two. As we are forced, um, AI, as it changes the way we construct jobs, it's going to force us to deconstruct them mm -hmm. and understand skills. Yeah. And, you know, there's been a lot of promise around skills, but being able to effectively decorate the employee record with skills in a meaningful way and then do workforce planning around skills and cost around skills, along with all those other things that are important in shaping the workforce, um, I think we're going to see huge innovations around that. Um, those are the two I'm actually looking forward to. So I'll stop right there. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot that you took some minutes time here on this uh, great conference. It was a pleasure talking to you, Paul. Likewise. All the best for Vizier. And nice you. meeting you. All right. So sitting here now at the Radency booth. It's a giant booth. Very cool looking. And I'm here with Jakida Akpa. She's SVP for innovation at Radency Labs. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks so for it's, having me. <laughs> it's great to have you here. Is it um, the first time that you're here on the HR Tech Conference? Yeah, it's actually the first time that I've been here, but not the first time for Radency. No, Radency, yeah. I think, is a regular <laughs> exactly. guest since you are one of the major players in, in the business here um, in the US, but also, of course, in Europe. What are your feelings, your personal feelings about the conference? Did you learn something new? Any surprises? It's actually been interesting. I think um, not a ton of surprises. I feel like there's been a continued conversation about skills, you know, kind of the skills technology that's happening right now, people thinking about skills for hiring and mobility. Um, I think, as you can imagine, it was everything generative AI, and that was also the expectation going in as well. I think the most interesting aspect has been listening to some of the um, research that's been coming out about the expectations of TA leaders, where there is opportunity, and the biggest thing is around efficiency. Efficiency yeah. is the you know kind of term du jour right now, and the organizations that are looking to create real efficiencies and real outcomes, I think will be the winners. Oh, I keep my fingers crossed for you. <laughs> um, since you're SVP for the Innovation Labs uh, at Radency, what are the latest things, the latest uh, 
uh, tools uh, within Radency itself? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, what we've been trying to do at Radency, and we've been focused on data and data-driven technology for a really long time, and in looking at the opportunity around generative AI, again, the concept is around understanding the data, not just big data, the ones and zeros, but also understanding the contextual aspects. When we think about generative AI and you know big players like OpenAI, a lot of it is consuming a lot of content from around the web and ensuring that that's digestible and leveraged by the large language models. So thinking in terms of that as well, we have you know kind of massive amounts of both ones and zeros data, but also contextual data via content on our site. So the focus first has to be what are we trying to get done for the end user? And that's both the candidate and the recruiters. I think a lot of um, vendors are coming in from a technology first approach and we're doing a user first approach. How are we creating real change? And so a lot of the focus has been around some of those tools. On the career site, it really is understanding that there's a new generation coming into the market and they're looking to broaden the way that they're searching. So it isn't just, here's a job I'm looking for and go, but understanding Things like skills, but yes, if we have natural language processing baked into the platform, allowing them to have a little bit more space with how they're doing more exploration and discovery, pulling back not only jobs, but content that answers those questions. So that's kind of our focus on the candidate side of the house. It's recognizing that anything that in, in engages the candidate and makes their process more effective, we also have to care for what that means for the recruiter as well. So allowing recruiters to go into like a CRM, for example, and how are they leveraging that exact same technology to be able to surface the right candidates for the skills for today, but also for the future, allowing them to not necessarily only use Boolean search, but really more of that natural language processing. So that's really our big focus. It's not just looking at the point solution, the moment in time, but looking across the entire workflow and figuring out, based on our technology and the data we have at hand, how can we really make an impact? Because there's still that issue around recruiter burnout. And I think a lot of technology is creating more burnout and it's not creating less, so we want to be really mindful about that. That's very interesting. In, in terms of the AI hype cycle, I learned a new word, <laughs> yes. which is agentic AI. Okay. I heard it the first time, uh, uh, the first morning I, I was here. Okay. In Germany, nobody talks about agentic AI. Okay. Everybody talks about chatbots and, and things like that. Yeah. Uh, so what's your perspective on, on that so one? So my perspective there is that I think that everyone is using chatbot like a hammer and nail and that it's the solution to every single thing. I sat in a really interesting session today and the TA leader talked about first looking across her tech stack and looking for efficiencies by combining and connecting a lot of her point solutions to kind of one end-to-end -end platform. And I think when you throw things like chatbot on top of a process that's already fractured, siloed, and broken, you actually exacerbate the problem. So it's looking at other opportunities besides chatbot, thinking about how are we leveraging natural language processing? How are we leveraging machine learning? Where are the opportunities where it's just AI summarization and not a chatbot that actually will have a better impact and experience for either the candidate or the recruiter? If you look one year into the future, yeah. and we would be sitting here in 25 Absolutely. and having the same discussion, yeah. what would you expect? Any, any major changes? I do, and this is my own personal opinion, yeah. I think that we're also on a hype cycle with the conversation around skills. And I feel like I remember maybe about six years ago when it was more about the upskilling and it wasn't about kind of the fervor around generative AI impacting skills, but we had been on this skills journey for a really long time. I think it's a difficult journey. So I expect that to kind of tamp down a little bit. And my expectation is to see more around how are we thinking about competencies? How are we thinking about the tasks that are aligned with jobs? Because I think what's missing is the fact that generative AI is still it still hasn't landed. And so where it will ultimately land as a technology may subsume more and more skills that underline a job. So we're thinking about the skills of today without recognizing that those skills may not be necessary in the future. So I do see that as a, a trend that's gonna kind of taper off with something else to come afterwards. Well, we see what will happen next year. Absolutely. Thanks for taking the time here, joining Zadkorn. Thank you, Jakita Akbar. Thank you. One name which is really mentioned in several keynotes I saw uh, was Paradox. I'm sitting here with Josh Swayan. He's the Chief Marketing Officer. Welcome to the Zatcon Podcast. Thank you so much. And it's interesting to hear us called one of the bigger companies. I'm, I'm used to us being a startup, uh, especially starting, uh, I started five years ago and we were about 50 employees. So it's, it's been a journey. 
But the whole booth here on the HR Tech Conference doesn't look like startup <laughs> at all. It's yeah. huge, actually. <laughs> yeah, we have, it's uh, 60 feet by 40 feet, so it's bigger than most people's yes. uh, home. But, um, you know, we try to create an experience for our clients when they come in and, and make it feel light and airy. So. <laughs> You just told me that you hired the first sales representative for Germany. That's right. The person did not start yet, will start in a few weeks. That's right. So give the German les listeners some impressions. What is Paradox about? What are you doing? Sure. So we, we started in 2016 with this idea that um, we wanted to give everybody an assistant to help get hiring work done. Um, we looked around. We're a team of uh, folks that have either been recruiters or, or TA practitioners in our, in our past. Um, so we know the job and we know how difficult it can be. And the one thing we know about hiring is there's a bunch of administrative work uh, and tasks that need to be done for somebody to be hired. And oftentimes those tasks are you know, screening candidates, scheduling interviews, um, uh, answering questions, following up with candidates. All this them. administrative stuff. Exactly. Uh, and, and all of that stuff is not, it doesn't make the process better or more human for the candidate or for the recruiter or for the company. It doesn't, doesn't lead to a better hire. Uh, just by doing it. And so the idea was, could we automate those things for teams so that they could either spend more time with people um, or make the hire faster, uh, save money in the process? So we kind of started with this idea of how do we create an assistant that can work 24 hours a day, seven days a week to do that stuff? Um, you know, initially, I think it was in the form of what we sometimes call a chat bot, uh, but this conversational interface. Um, we've, we've evolved over time into kind of categories that most people know, an applicant tracking system, a CRM, a career site, but always with this idea of a conversational assistant that can be there to help the candidate or help the recruiter or help the hiring manager uh, throughout the hiring process. The conversational assistant, is that something that's related to your own ATS or is it like a layer you can connect with other ATS tools as well? Yeah, so it's a little bit of both. Um, and we, we don't typically go into a client forcing them to use our ATS. Uh, in fact, often we're partners with Workday and SAP, um, uh, UKG, others, where if that's the system of record, we can just sit right on top. And so um, what we don't want to do is make the, the job harder for an HRS person or a systems person where they now have to consider, do I need to rip out this, this system that I've used for 10 years? Um, instead, the question is, how do I make that system work better? Um, so oftentimes what we do, just Workday, for example, or SAP, is if a recruiter lives in that system, we have a browser extension that can open up and you can review the, the chat history that a candidate had. Uh, you can take actions right from there. Uh, or we integrate with, with the system for SEP and status. So if you want to schedule an interview, all you do, need to do is move the candidate to that stage and, and then our assistant will take care of the rest. So, you know, as much as we can remove friction from the process for everybody and make things easier, we, we try to do that. You know, we have an ATS and if somebody wants to buy it, great, but don't want to make that a requirement. Sounds super interesting. And at the end of the day, on the first day here, I learned a new word, at least for me, coming from Germany, agentic AI. <laughs> yeah. And I think you're a perfect example of, yeah. of that, right? Yeah, exactly. It's, um, you know, we, we've always called it an AI assistant. Um, you know, you hear co-pilot and uh, some people call it a chatbot. But it's this idea that, um, you, know, you know, in a retail environment, for example, or a restaurant or, or a hotel, um, there are typically not recruiters in those environments that are, are doing or supporting the hiring work. It's often uh, a hotel manager or a restaurant manager. Um, so the agent can sit there by their side invisibly um, and, and be their recruiter, essentially take care of all the recruiting tasks and administrative work. Um, but yeah, it's, I think there's a lot of buzzwords. I don't know how you felt about HR tech, but it's, it's a lot of uh, new language for the same things. Uh, I worry that it confuses uh, actual buyers and practitioners. Um, oh, well, I agree, but but isn't that the same with all growing um, businesses? Uh, yeah. There's always new wordings, new buzzwords uh, going around. Yeah. But then again, I, I thought about it. I like the, the term agentic AI yeah. because it really describes what it's about. So yeah. given the, uh, the short history of paradox, yeah. Um, Josh Bersin also mentioned yesterday in his keynote yeah. your, how can I say, awesome growth record yeah. uh, also in, in terms of sales. Yeah. So what's your internationalization strategy? Yeah, so we, we've always approached uh, international expansion uh, from a, a pull, not a push perspective. And what I mean by that is that we want our clients to pull us into the region as opposed to us, you know, uh, riding in on our ships and trying to conquer some new new territory with a bunch of sales reps and, uh, and overinvestment in people before the demand is there. 
And so I think that obviously works well for us where, um, you know, in some ways, uh, you know, we could be more aggressive in how we push into new countries and, and, uh, and new continents. But uh, we'd rather that the market kind of pull us in. Uh, and then from there, we can expand and invest, which is what we've done. We started with a very small team in the UK about uh, two and a half, three years ago when the company was 200 people, you know, so it's, you know, we were very small, they were very small. Um, we didn't have a lot of money to, to invest there. So it was how do we serve the clients best? So uh, Unilever, Nestle, uh, McDonald's, uh, Pandora are now clients in, um, in Europe among uh, dozens of others. But it started with serving those clients well. Uh, our, our strategy has always been if we can make them successful in region, uh, they'll tell the story for us yeah. and then they can drive the expansion with us as opposed to us having to ride in on a horse and, and try and sell an idea. All right. I, I, I will keep a close look on yeah. Paradox in the German market. Yeah. Thanks for the interview. Absolutely. Have fun with everything. Aside from Paradox, now more generally speaking about this conference, yeah. is there anything that surprised you? Um, that's a really great question. I think um, I'm certainly not surprised by the messaging around AI. I think everybody is trying to figure out how they can either if on the vendor side, it's how they can put a halo around the business by using uh, the word AI. I think what I'm, uh, I wouldn't, I don't know if I'm surprised by it, but I'm pleased by it is a lot of our conversations have been around uh, the problem we're trying to solve. I think our CEO, Adam, likes to say that nobody goes out shopping for AI. They go out uh, shopping for productivity or efficiency, or they have some pain they're trying to solve. And so a lot of our conversations in this, this booth here have been, um, what's the problem you're trying to solve? And then what's the right tooling to solve it? Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's AI and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's a very boring uh, workflow automation tool. And that's not AI, but that's, that's fine too. So I think it, you know, the, the hype cycle of everybody's going to be talking about AI, then there's going to be some um, you know, I, I think some uh, uh, distrust of AI or, or it, you know, they buy a tool that doesn't work, it's going to crash and then it'll come back up and we'll level off at um, tools that actually solve real problems. So um, I wouldn't say I'm surprised, but I'm, I'm happy that it's trending towards, you know, what, what are the actual pain points in this industry that, mm -hmm. that um, both candidates, companies are trying to, to solve for? And then what are the right tools to do it? Um, and then how do, you, how do you make that match? So. Thanks a lot for your opinion and it was a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, absolutely. Same. Thanks for having me. Thank, Thank you. Das war die erste Folge Ask Ingolf. Lasst uns doch wissen, wie ihr diese Folge fandet. Könnt ihr gerne bewerten, beispielsweise bei Spotify. Aber viel wichtiger noch, sagt mir doch einfach mal Bescheid, welche Themen wir als nächstes im Kontext AI hier besprechen sollen. Meldet mir dazu einfach an saatkorn.googlemail.com oder über LinkedIn äh, einfach mein Profil Gero Hesse. Ich freue mich auf euer Feedback. Bis dann. Ciao.